name is Matthew Barton. I am the curator of recorded sound here at the Library of Congress. Uh, actually, I don't, I'm not usually here in this building. I'm usually down in Culpeper. Oh, okay. Um, it's easier said than done. I think it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, more than one way to be heard. Uh, all right. <laughs> How's that? Can you hear me now? <laughs> all right, great. Yeah, so uh, usually I'm down in Culpeper, Virginia, uh, at a building called the NAVCC, the National Audiovisual Conservation Center, which is where we store all of our audiovisual uh, materials, uh, which amount to, at this point, I believe 3.6 million sound recordings and another 1.1, or maybe it's 2 million uh, moving image items, video and film. And, uh, it's uh, speaking as the curator of recorded sound, and our recorded sound collection includes a great deal of radio. Uh, it really warms the cockles of my heart when people come out uh, for an evening of radio. That they actually come, <laughs> leave their homes, uh, come to the Library of Congress, sit in a place like this to listen, not to watch so much as to listen. And uh, was, when I was thinking about what to say tonight to introduce Jim, I remembered something that Fred Allen said about ra radio. Fred Allen, great comedian satirist of what we call the golden age of radio in the 30s and 40s, uh, who never quite recovered from the uh, uh, ascent of television in the 50s, had this to say. The radio listener saw nothing he had to use his imagination. It was possible for each individual to enjoy the same program according to his intellectual level and his mental capacity. With the high cost of living and the many problems facing him in the modern world, all the poor man had left was his imagination. Television has taken that away from him. Uh, so, <laughs> obviously he didn't think too much of television. Uh, I'm okay with television, I'm sure you are too. Uh, but a really interesting thing happened at about the same time that Fred Allen wrote that as television was becoming ascendant, which is that the portable tape recorder became something that was in reach, uh, not to everybody, but it was something that if you thought that's what you wanted to do and you saved some money for a while, you could get one. You could go out in the world and record what you wanted and bring it back and find a way to program it to present it. And uh, people did that beyond the obvious applications for recording music and political speeches and things like that. Innovators like Tony Schwartz, whose collection is, is here at the Library of Congress, went out and collected sounds and thoughts and dreams and gave them back to the world uh, a as a means of not only of communication but also inspiration. And uh, I, I see tonight's guest, Jim Metzner, very much in the tradition of innovators like Tony Schwartz. And Jim, you actually, you knew Tony Schwartz. You interviewed him, didn't you? Yeah. So there's a direct connection there. And, uh, but at, this, at the same time, you know, we're also in touch with the golden age of radio, where there was always a very busy person doing sound effects. And <laughs> without Eileen here, it's all just talk. So uh, with that, then, um, I'd just like to bring up Jim Metzner from <laughs> He started with uh, the sounds of Boston, progressed to the sounds of science, and to the pulse of the planet, and next stop is the universe. So, Jim. Hi, thank you, Matt. Can, first of all, can you all hear me? Uh, a request to, if you haven't already, please turn off your cell phones. And just uh, a thanks not only to Matt, but to the entire team at, of in the Library of Congress, um, Karen and Jay and Tom and others who we were going to hear some great sounds over a great system, and I really appreciate it. It's really wonderful for me to be here tonight uh, with some people, who, people, 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 with some people.
people who I've known for decades. And so to have you here tonight, it's really like um, returning back and coming home. So I feel really uh, welcome here. and Thank you for coming. So having said that, I'm Jim Metzner, and celebrating 30 years as a radio series and now as a podcast, this is The Pulse of the Planet. Our theme music, for those of you who may not be familiar with the program, written by Tommy Ayer, and the title, Pulse of the Planet, after 30 years, still, I think, has merit or still resonates with the idea that the world is alive, it's pulsing, it's speaking to us all the time if we know how to listen to it. And there are actually hints about that idea the world speaking to us from the past. So, for example, in Imperial Japan, the emperor, dressed in full regalia, with his entire court, would go out to Kyoto, to Ashiyama, which is a sacred place near Kyoto, and they would go for one purpose, to listen. And what were they listening for? Well, here's a clue. There's a poem written in honor of what they were tuning into. If a jewel of dew could sing, it would tinkle with such a voice. Anybody want to guess what that might be? It's a cricket. Suzumushi, Homeogrillus japonica, the bell cricket. And the members of court, of the emperor's court, would collect them. And they'd take them back and they would judge which one was the best singer. And even today, till today, in this, in this time, in Japan, the collection and the keeping of crickets as, as pets is still uh, very much... Um, a tradition in Japan. They keep them in little cricket cages and they release them around this time of year. But the idea, as I was preparing this talk and thinking about it and r reminding myself about that sound and that practice, that was, in fact, one of the Pulse of the Planet programs uh, from the 30-year history of the series, was I was trying to think, and maybe you could too, are there any examples in our society that you can think of, concerts aside, so, you know, not besides going to the JFK Center to hear somebody fabulous sing, um, play some music. Aside from music, do we ever go to places to hear, to listen intentionally? Anything come to mind? Yeah. The beach to hear the ocean, for sure. Anybody else? If we, if we have any other, if you have any other thoughts on that, maybe towards the end we'll come back. I, I had a couple, as I was thinking, I couldn't think of that many, quite frankly, places where you might go to listen intentionally. But if it's true that we're living in a world of vibration and that sounds are, in fact, informing us all the time, I mean, f frankly, the sounds aren't stopping, but we may not be at paying attention to them, but if we're being bombarded with sounds all the time and they're speaking to us, well, let's try and experiment and see if that really might be true. We're going to play two sounds and see if you can tell now, just very simply, what are these sounds telling you?
So, what do you think? Morning, for sure. What else? Can't hear you. Sit up a little bit. The early bird gets the worm right. Well, there's certainly a bird that we heard. Yeah. Anything else? What? Did, what about the place? Time of day, morning for sure. Anything else? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, human activity for sure. And so, w yeah. Huh, why? Uh huh. Yeah, so it's all right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, certainly sounds of animal life, lots of birds, and some human activity. Anybody uh, hone in more on the human activity? It was a little subtle. Yeah. S tools? School. Pool. Swimming pool. Wow. I'll have, why, and, and why a pool? Why, what, would you, what made you think of that? Ah, good call. Interesting. Um, what are we not hearing? Tra traffic. No engines. So in a way, it's but that's uh, in un, in itself is sort of telling you where we're, we are and where we're not. So we'll come back to here's a second uh, sound. Have a listen. Yeah, one, one bam. I have a lot of association with Marjan. My mother used to play it, and I would hear her and Ida Dryblatt play Marjan. And, and, and when we, we grew up in Forest, yeah, one bam, two times. God, that's a blast from the past. No one has ever said Marjan for this, but a great association. Anybody else? What else? What was the first word? The, the echo, yes. Absolutely. So when you said pool before, it made me think of this sound. Would you say this sound was more echoey or less echoey? More echoey, of course. So yeah, so the echo is telling you something. So where are we? What is it saying about this place? I can't hear you. Monastery. What part of a monastery? Close, because monasteries might have a what? Bingo, a courtyard. So it's going to be echoey, and yet, so it's sort of like outside, but not entirely. But what about what we heard at the beginning, that what? Building, yeah, there were some hammering, and there was something at the beginning. That's one possibility. Anybody else have another thought about what that was? Uh, it had a certain rhythm, though, and the rhythms. What do you think? Maybe. What? My man. Close. You get, you get the prize. But, but, but flip-flops would have a di The rhythm was right. So you're ha you got the rhythm part. It was the rhythm 
of a child, in fact, a girl. It's just the rhythm, some part of the, uh, as you hear it, it's, uh, of course, yes, it's a child's, a, a, a girl's running, but what does she have in her feet? It ain't flip-flops. Bingo. You got it. Clogs. So she's running. So, I mean, the sounds are telling us that. We just, you just have to, you know, decipher it in a way. And they're speaking to us without words. Now, these have been all relatively subtle, nondescript soundscapes. But there are sounds that basically demand our attention. They grab you by the ears and they say, remember me, record me. And this is what sound recordists, guys like, like Matt was saying, like, uh, like Tony Schwartz did or Alan Lomax uh, did. Uh, we attune to the world, take these impressions and, and share the world of sound in the same way that photographers take impressions of the visual landscape. Well, Minor White, and I know there are some of uh, folks here who know Minor, uh, was a photographer who my very good friend who is in this audience, Mr. Lee Ewing and I, many moons ago in 1972, were Minor's assistants on a photographic trip that he took across the country, and it was an amazing trip. We hung out with Ansel Adams. Minor co-developed the zone system of photography with Ansel. Well, we would spend the whole day photographing things. We would be photographing rock walls, you remember? And Minor had this big camera and we had these little Leicas and he would be there and the mall would be full of moss and we would, he would just be standing there photographing this rock wall and people would come by sometimes and sort of see a guy photographing a rock wall and there some guy would come up and maybe pluck up his courage and saying, you photographing a rock wall? And we go, yeah. <laughs> That's what we were up to. But one day, Minor came to me and, and said, and he had a very deep voice. I don't know if I could do it, but it was something like, well, Jim, some, something out there is waiting for me to record it, <laughs> to photograph it. Something out there is waiting for me <laughs> to photograph it. I don't know what it is, but it will find me. And I've spent the better part of my life recording, and Miner's words have come back to me because there are sounds that really find you. Had it not been for you, it would have never been remembered or heard or shared. It would be like that tree that fell in the forest and nobody was there to hear it. This is one of those sounds and it was completely unexpected. And I'll give you a little bit of prep. First of all, this is I went to Brazil uh, in 75 and this is like the first thing I recorded. I was in a little town of Cachoeira which is in Salvador in Bahia the heart of Brazil, and there was this church service that was just ending, and uh, you'll hear as the service begins, the choir master is having a slight conversation with the organist, and everything that you're about to hear was exactly as it happened. There's no editing, there's no mixing. <coughs> what you hear is what I got in this moment, and then the, the recording just sort of I was carrying my recorder, so we sort of followed the crowd out, I the congregation, out into the street.
They didn't disappoint. Well, to witness and record a moment like that, you really feel like you've been given a gift. And you become very still, attentive to the sound. And that's partly te technical, because if there are any sound recordists out there, there are people here, I'm sure, who record sounds. Tom Miller, you're one of them, yeah. Well, you know that if you make too much noise, you just ruined your recording, so you have to be still, so it's partly technical. But really, every act of listening, really listening, demands this quality of attention, doesn't it? It reminds us that, like the world that we're listening to, which is alive, we, too, are alive. Right now, the vibration of my voice traveling through this room is reaching you through your skin into your bones. And it may be subtle, but right now we are in resonance. And as an experiment, we could even try now, if you like, to maybe come into resonance a little bit more. There's uh, an exercise that my friend Tim Hill, who does uh, Who Meet, singing, this singing that when you do it, you actually accentuate some of the tones of your voice, which are in all of our voices, to bring out two tones at the same time. I'm not saying we're going to start singing Tuvan throat chant now, <laughs> but, <laughs> but as an experiment, we're going to go through a series of vowels together. We'll find a note, and we're going to say the word why, except we're going to really if you want to participate, and why not? I mean, you know, close your eyes, no one will, no one will see you. <laughs> and we're going to say, why? But it's going to go, why? And we'll pick a note, I don't know, let's f somebody find a note, ooh, is that a good note for you? Ooh, ooh, so why? Ready? Ooh, go backwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even in that you could hear the just the taste of the overtones, the the parts of our voice that are there all the time. But if you go and you try that at home, <laughs> you don't have to be a professional, you can try this at home, in a very reflective place like your car or the shower, try that and you'll start to hear the overtones that are present in your voice and in every sound. Uh, there are just certain places where the environment makes it a little bit more possible for you to hear them. So right now, whether we're making sound together or not, we're all breathing together in a silent chorus, creating at the same time with our listening that we're doing together by default, an atmosphere of listening. And if you don't believe that, tell me the truth. Uh, if you're in a conversation with somebody, can't you tell 
intuitively whether that person is listening to you or not. You know it, right? Sometimes it's body language. Sometimes it's just this, you know when somebody's tuning out and you know even better when they're tuning in. Now, what is that all about? So when you have a group of people listening together, we are creating between us a, an amplified kind of listening that's maybe only possible when a group of people are together listening on behalf of something else. And any actor, any performer knows that. You get a good crowd and they say, wow, great crowd tonight. And it helps, brings up the level of the music. Why? Well, maybe the performer was knowing that he or she was being listened to. It's like a feedback loop. Well, we're not any alone. We have lots of other entities on the planet <laughs> that are engaged in the process of listening. We've got company, a lot of company. So over the course of my career, I've interviewed many scientists, and we do have scientists. There are scientists in the house tonight. And I've interviewed, I don't know, hundreds, maybe even thousands, certainly thousands of scientists, but hundreds of bioacousticians whose job it is is to sort of monitor the pulse of the, of the creatures there are in the world. And you get the sense, I've gotten the sense after interviewing them, that my golly, it's as if every living thing on earth is in some form of receptivity or listening or communication. And we humans are only privy to a small portion of that. So for example, bats and rats are in the ultrasonic range, above the range of human hearing. Elephants are infrasonic. They're below the range of human hearing. And they actually communicate to each other. Uh, yeast cells <laughs> actually vibrate. Leaf hoppers, which are an insect, I promised, uh, um, I promised you that there would be some wild and crazy animal sounds. This is one of them. Leaf hoppers make a sound to each other that we humans can't hear. But if you were a leaf hopper and were on the surface of a plant, you'd be tuning into these vibrations. Well, somebody had the very clever idea, as, as a Japanese scientist, I believe, the very clever idea of taking what's called a transducer, which just translates vibration into sound. In fact, he used a phonograph needle, believe it or not, and he stuck it on the plant, plant the substrate of the plant, the mass of the plant. And these are the highly amplified sounds of leafhoppers, tiny insects. So w transduce sound, if you want an example of transduce sound, uh, you could, if you put your uh, palm of your hand against your ear and tap on your elbow, you can hear that. Do you hear that? Now, how are you hearing that? If you tap with your knuckles on your elbow, you're hearing it, right? So how are you hearing that? Pardon? Ball in the bone, yeah. It's being conducted, transduced through, through the same principle. So, of course, there are plenty of insects that we do hear all the time, like cicadas and crickets. They are among the voices of nature that we hear many evenings, along with amphibians. And this is a taste of a nighttime chorus in Brazil's Pantanal. It's actually not only Brazil. There's a number of co uh, con countries around this um, the largest wetland in Brazil excuse me, the largest wetland in the world, of which Brazil is just one of the countries in the, um, on the map. I think Paraguay is another, and I'm 
trying to remember. There are four countries in the Pantheon. Anybody know off the top of their head? I don't remember what they are. Largest wetland in the world, and at night, the chorus sounds like this. Now, when we're listening to it, you might try as a maybe a exercise or just a, an experiment to hear the spatiality of the sound. In other words, where well, th there's a different sound over here. There's a three sounds are uh, in 3D. We're getting a spatial effect of where the different sounds are. And sounds also have a kind of a texture, and they may even have a kind of an image, not the necessarily the image of what it is that's making that sound, but the image of the sound itself that could be produced in your mind um, as you hear it. So, Any images come to mind? Anybody want to? Well, what are you thinking when you hear that? I don't know why, but there's something. I mean, one of the sounds reminds me of the surface, sort of like the, the walls of this room. You know, there's something rough and uneven about it. And it's like something being scraped. So, most morning. of insects and amphibians and insects cross-fading with the sounds of a dawn chorus of birds. This dawn chorus was recorded in the Grampians, which is a, a park outside of Melbourne, west of Melbourne, Australia. And it's a park run by Aboriginal peoples. And as um, I was recording this, the crack of dawn. I was surrounded by birds and many other creatures, including kangaroos, which you won't hear. They weren't <laughs> making any sounds. I don't think kangaroos make a sound. But just the fact that knowing that there were kangaroos around, I think, is <laughs> cool. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, one of my favorite uh, dawn choruses. And, and there's another experiment of another kind of listening to imagine, and you can try this also with the musical sound as well. As you're listening, try to imagine a mountain or, or visualize a mountain of sound, that the lows are at the bottom of the mountain and the highs are at the top. And as you're listening, it's as if you become the mountain and, and you're sort of reaching, you're sort of reaching for the higher notes and that even affects your posture, so that there's a kind of a posture, a more erect posture of listening, or a, po a posture that's conducive to listening, especially reaching for those highs. This exercise, I didn't invent. It's something that belongs to Alfred Tomatis's work in the Listening Center, and he's someone who spent his life, who spent his life studying listening. Anyway, it's something you might try as you listen to the sound from the Grampians, the Dawn Chorus.
And these are recordings now of birds in the wood thrush family, the uh, wood thrush, hermit thrush, viri, at normal speed and then slow down. And you'll hear what, what the recordings reveal. Birds, of course, can also talk or mimic. This is another serendipitous moment, and it's a conversation between a girl and a talking parrot. They'll be, it was recorded in Brazil, so they're speaking Portuguese. And um, you'll hear the parrot on one side, I forget which is, and the girl on the other. I'll point them out to you. Chama a galinha. Que <risos> parou. Olha que louca linda. Chuchu, chuchu, chuchu. Vem pra cá. 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 She's saying is, I'm mad at you. And the daughter says, I'm mad at you. She's saying, you're mad at me? I'm mad at you. <laughs> I, this may be as close as to objective art as you'll hear tonight, because every, every <laughs> in the sense that every I've listened to that recording countless times, and every time I hear it, it, it just brings a smile to my face. You know. It's one of those things. So you've made a memorable recording. You've been given this gift, this little nugget of audio gold. And now you're dying to share it because this act of sharing is an imperative that we have in common with virtually every other living thing on Earth, this need to connect it's, and to commune. In this case, to share what you tuned into, this thing that touched you deeply. So now you search for a context that you can grab somebody by the ears and say, hey, listen to this. So what would it be? Is it going to be a CD? Well, it may be. In fact, I have two CDs right here that you're welcome to buy if you want to later on. <laughs> you only got two um, of some of the sounds you've heard. But what I've done mostly is not sell CDs. Um, it's to make radio programs and now podcasts. And you, you make it and you cross your finger uh, or fingers, as the case may be, and uh, you hope that somebody will actually pay attention. Well, one approach is to frame a sound in a story. So here's an early Pulse of the Planet program which demonstrates that possibility of framing a sound within a little story. <laughs> A group of pilot whales had beached themselves, and now as the tide was falling, word was getting out, and Cape Cod's ad hoc army of volunteers was coming to the rescue. I'm Jim Metzner, and this is the Pulse of the Planet. 
Right now, the tide is going out, and these animals are going to be high and dry for the foreseeable future. That is either until the next tide comes up to float them 12 hours from now, or until we can pick them up and move them. We're checking out the area right now, looking for pools that may remain after the tide goes out. We may be able to move them and keep them in those pools. That would be the best scenario. Dave Wiley is with the International Wildlife Coalition, one of the many environmental groups that come together during a whale rescue. Right now we're covering them with blankets and sheets, one to keep the sun off them and keep them moist, and also, to, in some degree, help them control their body temperature. They can quickly overheat in a situation like this, so it'll keep the water on to keep them cool, or in some cases, if they go into shock, they could start getting cold. Um, in that case, we'll use other things and put more blankets on them and try to keep them warm. Why expend all this effort to save stranded whales? Why not let nature take its course? Well, we don't know what, what nature's course is, and so it's very difficult to stand back and just say, well, this is nature's way. It's like when people in India, they say, well, it's somebody's karma to drown. Well, maybe it's your karma to save them. You know, that, that's kind of a, a roundabout answer. But right now, we're doing so many negative things to the planet that it's nice to have one thing that you can do that has maybe a positive influence, and, and this certainly does. It's true. After a while, I put down my microphones and lent a hand in the rescue operation. Looking into the eye of a whale close up and hearing it breathe and vocalize was the only payment that any of us volunteers expected. That and the feeling that maybe, just maybe, you helped save the life of a fellow creature. This archival program is part of our 30th anniversary celebration. If you want to hear more, check out our podcast. So, sound can also reveal something unexpected, even in a familiar territory. And, and you've got to believe, make the player believe in the strike. So however how you go about that, that's your own personal style. What separates one major league umpire from another? It's a personal style based primarily on sound. We talked with three American League umps in Seattle recently, and they demonstrated and talked about why they sound the way they do. I'm Jim Metzner, and you're hearing America recorded on Maxell Tape. Well, I've never said a strike in my career. I just never could get a sheer, I just couldn't get it out. Yeah, that's a strike. But you really got to feel it. Yeah, that's it. Mine is uh, one that I just go Aah! like that, and uh, the strike three is just I'll reach in and pull back, and it's Aah! Aah! like that. Looks like a karate move, but it, you know it works. In that, a lot of times, uh, the louder you are, you drown out a lot of the criticism too. So by the time I'm done with my my opera, uh, you know they're not yelling too much. And my particular deal is just, yeah, three would be strike three. Three? Three. Three. And we that's call them from our heart. Strike. You know, basically, we don't care who wins the ball game. So the idea is to go out there and try and get in as little trouble as possible. And if you're aggressive out there and you sell yourself, you know, a lot of times you'll, you'll stay out of arguments by being aggressive. My thanks to American League umpires Larry Barnett, Derwood Merrill, and Rocky Rowe. I'm Jim Metzner, and you're hearing America recorded on Maxell tape. Maxell, it's worth it. <laughs> that was one of the predecessors of Pulse of the Planet, one of the series that uh, I think Matt had mentioned. Well, <laughs> I have, I, my favorite is I.E. <laughs> Sometimes you'll be out recording and there are certain sounds, certain places where you feel like you're being kind of pulled along. You're, the sounds are pulling you. You're taking this journey. So we're going to now take a little journey in sound. And this journey is to Morocco, one of the great s cities of Morocco. A tape recorder is a pocket full of breadcrumbs. When you record sounds, wherever you go, you leave an invisible trail from moment to moment. And then one day, you listen to the tape, and you find your way back again. 
This trail leads to Morocco, the city of Fez, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Let's follow these sounds and see where they take us. Fez is really three cities. The first, a modern European-style metropolis. The second, Fez el Jadid, or New Fez, dates from the 13th century. And Old Fez, Fez el Bali, goes back to the 9th century. And that's where we are now. Picture an ancient walled city. And inside the walls is a maze of alleyways, too narrow for a car to get through. So the traffic inside Old Fez is mostly people and donkeys. Balak is the donkey driver's equivalent of a car horn, and it means out of the way. 225,000 people inhabit the old city of Fez in an area roughly four and a half square miles. For the folks who live here, it's one enormous extended family. For a child growing up here, the alleyways of the old city are one extended playground. Amidst the bustle of activity of the city, always in motion like a giant human hive, there are moments when the sounds themselves will slow you right down. In a tunnel passageway with children playing nearby and tourists and tradespeople walking past, an old man intones praises to Allah. Morocco is an Islamic country, and in Fez's Medina, that's another name for the old city, there are literally hundreds of mosques. Five times a day, you can hear the call to prayer throughout the city, but probably the best place to hear it is from a rooftop, where it's just you and the pigeons. Non-Muslims are not allowed inside mosques, but it is possible to gain entrance to a Quranic school. Men who live and work in this part of the Medina come here to pray, but before they do, they remove their shoes and wash their feet, hands, and face at the fountain in the school's courtyard. As a flock of birds circles overhead, the imam begins his prayer facing towards Mecca, and a row of a dozen men standing shoulder to shoulder join him. Outside the courtyard of the Quranic school, 
the life of the Medina hums right along, and it's easy to be drawn through the alleyways and tunnels from one sound to another. That's the girab who carries a goatskin full of water and dispenses it in a brass cup to anyone who requires a drink. Along with the bell, his signature sound, the garab wears a broad-rimmed hat fringed with tassels and a costume bedecked with tiny mirrors. And for a few dirham, the Moroccan currency, he'll let you take his picture. The passageways of the old city are lined with stores and stalls selling a mix of modern and more traditional goods. Foods of every description, but most especially dates and olives. Spices, clothing, hardware, dry goods, school supplies, electrical supplies, video games, and cassettes. There are boom boxes everywhere here, and they compete for a niche in the raucous soundscape. In the ecology of the marketplace, tourists are both predator and prey, taking photographs at every opportunity of a people who, for the most part, really don't want to have their picture taken. In turn, the busloads of touristas who make their rounds through the Medina are hit on by hawkers, stall keepers, and would-be guides. The sounds of bargaining ripple through the Medina, and the merchants of Fez are master salesmen. This is old pieces. Mm -hmm. Bronze, old, mm -hmm. old bronze. Fifty dirhams. Uh, you, it's not the deal that is important. It is uh, your friendship for next time, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So money is not all. Six hundred dirham, you won't regret it, and it's a, a nice piece. There are subtler sonic delights in the old city, somewhat off the beaten pathways, like the sound of grain being sifted before it's ground into flour. Or the noise made by a little hand motor used to twist the cotton thread for making jalabas, the traditional men's outer garment. Fez has a rich tradition of craftsmanship. Whole sections of the old city belong to artisans who work in brass, stone, textiles, wood, and leather. In the Place Safarine, the stone chiselers work nearby the men who hammer the designs on brass trays. And sometimes it seems as though the rhythm of one is picked up by another. And then suddenly it's dusk, and the trail of sound morsels expands and intersperses throughout the old city. There's magic in the air, and what better place to hear it than at the Babu Jaloud, the Blue Gate, the place where most people enter and leave the Medina. In the throngs of humanity that parade by, and in those at the cafes that sit and watch them, there's an air of expectancy echoed by the birds who roost here, as if in the midst of all this apparent chaos, there's a last minute chance to make some sense of it all. And for a fleeting moment, the music that is hidden in all sounds reappears.
From Fez in Morocco, I'm Jim Metzner for The Savvy Traveler. Together continues just a little further with the idea that songs and stories are among the gifts that we've been given as guides to help us navigate through our collective journeys. Some Native American tribes have song carriers people who have been entrusted with specific songs to keep through over the generations. Storytellers carry the tales of our ancestors and of our times. And a great storyteller invokes a very special quality of listening. I can go forever without repeating a story. Story small over because I am a storytelling cat. That's what I am. You're hearing Boston on WEI FM. In the next two minutes, we'll talk with Brother Blue. I'm only known as Brother Blue. Nobody calls me anything but Brother Blue except my mama. You know how mamas are. I named you Hughes. And I was, okay, ma. On a sunny day on a traffic island in the middle of Harvard Square, there's a man all dressed in blue with bells and ribbons and butterflies all over him. Brother Blue begins telling stories to anyone who will stop and listen. Already a crowd is gathered, and magically, someone begins to sing. It's winter time! It's winter time! Street is full of snow! Mama's singing. Oh! Melting snow. Daddy comes in the door while Mama's singing Amazing Grace for Blue, you know. It's cold on me. When I go out in that little square, Brattle Square, that is my blue island where all the beautiful things, where my lions come out, and my dragons. And all you have to do is cross the sea in that traffic. And I don't care if there are sirens blowing and five engines going by and police whistles. On that island, we get into that blue, blue country, which is imagination. Give me your feet. He's rubbing my feet while mama sings. The next time you're in Harvard Square and you want to hear a great storyteller, just keep a lookout for that blue island. I'm Jim Metzner, and you're hearing Boston on WEI FM 103. It's possible to tell a story, to transform the listener and the teller of the story, and I believe they can transform the world. So perhaps inspired by the fact that we are in one of the greatest libraries of the world here, um, I'm wondering if we could say that song carriers and storytellers are both organic sound archivists. What do you think, Matt? You make a case for that, maybe? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thinking... One step further, what if each of us, in his or her own way, is a sound carrier? A sound carrier. What if we carry those vibrations within us that have left a deep impression? What if I inside each of us there's a repository, a unique library of memorable sounds that we've heard in our lifetime 
which return on occasion, accompanied usually by waves of nostalgia. Well, I spent a year doing interviews, collecting sound memories, asking people this question, which was sort of like when you got the response, and I got it a lot, it was like striking emotional oil. What sound kind of entered into you and never left, the sound you could hear even now in your bones? And then the challenge in creating the story that framed it was to either recreate or collect or recreate those sounds. So this is just an excerpt uh, from Sound Memories, which ran on All Things Considered some years back. Sunday mornings, I would be up in my bedroom early, and down in the kitchen, my mother would be making tomato sauce. And after the oil would heat up with the garlic, she would pour the tomatoes in. And as soon as the tomatoes hit, there would be a sizzle. And I would hear that sound, and the entire house would explode with this wonderful aroma and the scent. And it I never, never left me. And I can almost taste it as I hear it. my father in the kitchen singing to 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 say goodbye and he would just stroll up and down the hall in the house when I was growing up with his hands in his pockets and I could hear the change jingling in his pocket because he works in Manhattan he's got it needs all the coins in those days you need coins for subway tokens and he would be saying do 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 goodbye <laughs> goodbye <laughs> My mother was Scottish, and every Sunday morning at 8 a.m., she'd put the pipes and drums on full volume, and I woke up to that every Sunday morning of my life. And that made a very deep impression on me. It was sounds that got you out of the house. Maybe they drove you out. Maybe they drew you. Now, listening back, they're inviting you again. The fire alarm, the ice cream truck, the card that your friend attached with a clothespin to the fender of his bicycle made it sound like a motorcycle. Or the first time you ever went somewhere, just to listen to the sounds there. It was underneath the Brooklyn Bridge. Sounds do have a life of their own. They can take you to undiscovered places. But more often than not, they'll take you back to the brink of a memory, to a moment that was catalyzed by sound. When I was really young, I had a favorite uncle who lived with us for a while who used to tell me stories. And we had this habit. He would stretch out on the floor and with a big bowl of apples next to him and tell me stories while I rested my head on his stomach. All of these stories were accentuated by the sort of, of the apple and sort of the sound of his breathing. And whenever I hear the sound of an apple being bitten into, there's a little bit of the Once upon a time. pleasantness that was connected with those experiences. There was a princess who lived in a big castle. Want a bite? And far, far away in the forest, there lived a very mean ogre. You know how many heads he had? How many? Five. <laughs> five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. Yeah. And this ogre yeah. used to eat little children that would come by and then look at them. Yeah. Without 
just several years ago on the west coast of British Columbia. I found an abandoned seal pup and spent the night with it sleeping on my stomach. And its cries awakened something incredibly maternal within me, something which I wasn't aware of. And I still hear those, those haunting cries that really settled into the core of my being. Growing up in Algiers during the war, 1959 to 62, we lived in Hydra in the southern part of the city. And periodically, there would be bombings. And those would happen mostly at night. And so one of the most powerful sound memories that I have was a low percussive thud of bombs going off around the city. And the way the vibrations would transfer into the walls of the house and the metal shutters by my bedroom window. Often concurrent with that on these evenings with warm breezes coming up from the valley to the south of the city would carry slightly modulated voices of Berber tribeswomen ululating and that would sort of envelop the house and the sound that was at once beautiful but also terrifying on some levels. Long ago, it was in around 58, 59. We were all outside in the garden. It was late, maybe midnight. And suddenly, looking to the star, we saw three um, objects, three light in the, the sky. And it was coming I from first heard left the sound. I thought it was right. maybe a low-flying jet. And then I thought, well, maybe it's a couple of low-flying jets, and then it sounded really like a fleet of low-flying jets. And then, uh, you know, we ran outside to see this light. light in the, the sky, and it was coming from left to right. But the most strange of all was the sound. sound it was, was like so something in the wind, something uh, loud. between the wind and something metallic. That I felt that if it were any louder at all, that everything, me and all the life around me, would have been shattered. Something I will never forget, never. Fellow sound carriers, hopefully this has raised uh, collective antennae a bit, and I'm wondering if there are any um, questions or sounds or sound memories that uh, you have uh, that you want to share with us. Anybody have a, a sound memory, something that s stayed with you, that came back as you were thinking of this? Don't be shy. Yeah, see, Nancy. I can remember the Burundas to see the gorillas over in Rwanda. We went up through these carved farmlands going going up the mountain, and the line of demarcation between that and then this really incredible journey that we were going to be taking that day was stepping into a bamboo forest. And it was the first time I'd been in one. I've been in, been in different parts of the world since. But I never forgot this one because it was literally like going through a curtain into another plane. And all of a sudden, the sounds were completely different. And part of it was the the birds and the and the whatever other critters were living up high in the, in the canopy of this forest were completely different than they had been two steps over outside of it.
But also, I think the thing I most remember is the sound of the bamboo themselves crossing and clattering and clicking in this really musical pattern <coughs> way high up above us. That's great. That's a great sound. And now I've heard, I've never heard this myself, but I've heard anecdotally that in certain conditions you can actually hear bamboo growing. I don't know if that's true or not. But uh, wow, what an amazing sound. Thank you. That's a great one. So the sounds of being in a bamboo forest and the sound of going from one place to another. In Burundi, did you say? Rwanda. Any others? Even Yeah. Uh, so growing up, we didn't have uh, central heat in the house. Um, so my dad split wood for a wood stove. And so he taught me how to split from when I was really, really young. And you can tell when a mall hits a piece of wood, whether it's cracked all the way through. Mom just kind of printed it. He, could, he wouldn't be looking, but I, could be pra I, was, I was practicing. He could tell me whether it was going to split or not. From the sound of it, and even from the outside, it hasn't really moved. But you can hear this pop of the, all the strands releasing. And so listening for that and hearing him swing the ball is really indelible. It's a great sound, and as you're saying it, I I, I love to split wood myself, and I, I'm hearing it as you say it. And also, how many? I'm so glad you mentioned that in particular, because how many times are we being informed by sound, especially when uh, like with a car, you know, the first thing you'll be in your car and say, something's up. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's the brakes. Maybe it's the engine. But it's not sounding the way it's supposed to. I mean, we're, it's one of the things that inform us often when things are wrong or, or right. You can hear it first. There's a clue. Um, any, any other sound? Yeah. All right. Well, it's, you know, you presented such rich soundscapes, you know, in all the places you've been. And it's funny that what I thought of was, uh, this was this was a few years ago, and I was hiking by myself, and I was above the tree line in, Col in central Colorado, probably about 11,000 feet high. So there were, no, above the tree line, so there were no trees, and, you know, I could see the, see all around me, there was a big horizon, and there was very, this one part of the sound environment was, I mean, it was mostly quiet, but you could hear very, subtle movement of the air, it wasn't really breeze, but huh. just kind of very subtle movement of the air, and then every now and then there'd be a sound of an animal doing something, or a, a bird, but it was mostly near silence, but still there was a little sound there, and it's, it's so interesting to think about the fact that, you know, when we go through everyday life, I mean, I think one thing about everyday life in the city, and now everywhere, there's a lot of kind of manufactured sounds, like you have to have a soundtrack every time you go shopping or you go to a restaurant or something. And so I think when you're in an environment where you can, there's not, you know, a cacophony of sound, but there are, there's still a subtle sound going on, and then every now and then the more characteristic sound. Yes, that's so helpful, because then in, in a place like that, which, you know, it's relatively rare, certainly in the city, except maybe in the morning, in cities or late at night, but even in so, there's still the, the sound, that web of traffic going all the time. Without that, you become more finely attuned and more sensitized. I think that's a great example, thank you, of, um, of uh, the possibility of hearing things that we don't always necessarily hear. Any others? Yeah. What, I'm sorry, just a little louder? At a naval air station in Jacksonville, and, um, although I work medical side, I used to help out on the, in the hangars, especially at night. And, um, I, I remember distinctly being in one of the hangars, it was the last plane of the night coming in, and it, once it came in and the engine shut off, just the extreme loudness to the extreme quiet. You could hear the cicadas outside and the crickets, and it was just that sudden switch. So loud, you couldn't hear anything. It's so quiet. Ah, great. Did there was a, a moment like that in the piece? Did, is that sort of trigger the memory? Huh. Cool. Any others? Yeah. Huh. The Orioles were made to play a baseball game with no crowd in attendance. 
So uh, we, some of us who are season ticket holders, are used to the noise that Kakafe and the constant barrage of you know jumbotrons and hot dog races and all this nonsense. And and <coughs> you could go stand around the outside of the stadium in some of the publicly accessible places and listen to a professional baseball game being played with no crowd noise and no PA and no announcers. Wow. Twilight Zone. And the Orioles catcher actually uh, came out and, and, and to, uh, to catch batting practice and, and he waved to the non-existent crowd. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it's an, also, you're reminding me that it's another one of those sounds, a wooden sound, but you talk to an outfielder, and I have interviewed outfielders or baseball players, and they can tell by the crack of a bat. It's one of the things that informs them, well, is it going to be a, like a line drive? And aside, aside from the visual, they hear that sound, and they know it's going to, oh, it's a high popper or whatever. It's one of those things that has a different sound, quality of sound. Yeah, Tom. Uh, when I was very young, we lived um, on a street that had a park at the end of the block, and um, every Saturday morning in the fall, the local high school marching band would go past my window on the way to the football game, and so I would wake up, I would hear the distant sound, and they played out of tune because they weren't very good, and it would get louder and louder. It was something like a Doppler shit, I guess, but with volume instead of pitch, and um, and I always knew when they were right in front of the house, it would get the loud, and then it would slowly fade out as they would go past. And uh, I've always remembered that. Yeah, sounds in motion. Yeah. Very similar one, actually. It's a marching band one. It's uh, from Annapolis. Um, a few years ago, I was on a run and I stumbled on. Uh, I guess it was like, like the, the 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 meeting time before a competition of marching band. <laughs> so I was moving quickly, not the marching band. They were all stationary in their own little bubbles, but I was running through a, basically a field of marching bands practicing for a big day. <laughs> so they all go in and out. And I, I, I tried to record it even. I'm not really a sound recordist, but something about that. I want to capture it. But, but, uh, I wanted to share another one. Please, please, go on. When I was, uh, when I was growing up, we'd go to my grandparents' house and, and always want to walk to a sand hill. Um, we called it a sand hill, but really there are a lot of small pebbles. And I would, would, would make piles and we'd, and we'd spend you know, an hour or two throwing rocks down the sand hill. So the sound of rocks clacking together. And, and I hadn't made this connection um, you know, until hearing your, your talk and listening to some of the sounds, but I, I, I live, I live at, a, at a monastery now. Um, and after um, evening prayer, there's usually like a, a, a period of meditation, and, and the, the abbot will break the silence with a small stone that he, he clacks against um, the, the pews where they sit. Uh, I've always found it very pleasant, uh, and it's occurring to me now why I might find that sound so pleasant, and I look forward to it. Uh, so. uh, can you say what kind of uh, monastery it is? Which yeah, it's it's Benedictine. Benedictine. In, I think uh, St. Benedict said, incline thy heart's ear. It was one of the things he said. And so chanting, do you chant? Uh, well, that me when I was mentioning about Tomatis before, he was, uh, Alfred Tomatis was famously called to a group of Benedictine monasteries, uh, uh, to a Benedictine monastery where all the, where they had stopped. Somebody, it seemed like a good idea at the time that they would stop chanting and have more time for other stuff. And, and, and in his own words, he found them in their cells lying like a bunch of limp dish rags. That was his description of it. And he basically, his, his um, remedy was to get them chanting again. And that energized the sound of the chant, which he went on to thinking that that particular frequency, which is heard in the middle of the Gregorian chant, which is about 1,000 1, cycles per second, he felt energized the brain. Now, I've that I don't know if that's true or not. He also felt Mozart in particular, the music of Mozart was prominent in those frequencies. But that, the, that quality of music he felt helped, well, as he put it, energize the brain, which is an interesting idea. And he also felt that there were certain kinds of sounds in music that did the opposite. So lucky you to be in the midst of that sound environment. And a lot, so many traditions have that sound. In, in uh, Greek Orthodox, there's a sound of a, of a, of a, 
uh, not, and it has a particular name which I've forgotten, um, but it's also the sound of like hitting something and then getting one right behind it. Um, any others? Yeah. Find the many sounds of water. Uh, just magic. The, uh, the rain that starts to, to be played. Yes. Yeah. Uh, or in the forest, it may be a stream. Uh, it may be someone talked about the, the beach uh, before. It has this way of uh, bringing. bringing And we are touched by the sounds of water. And in fact, that was one of the sound memories. You don't hear it, but uh, it was the last one. It was rain on the roof of a tin roof. And many, many people had mentioned that. And there, so if, you, if we listened to the end of the piece, you'd hear somebody talking about that sound memory he had of a very particular place, and the evocative sound of water. So absolutely. So, so we live in a world of vibration that we mostly take for granted. And we also carry within us this inner archive of sounds and complete with <laughs> all of the associate, relentless associations that come with them. And somehow, our lives are lived between these two realms of sound, the, the outer and the inner. And this in-between place is a little mysterious. It's a little unknown. It's quiet, it's still, it's sensitive. It's a bit like being in the eye of a storm, attuning to something very subtle. It may be a vibration that is more sensed and felt than heard. It's like if you've ever had the experience of someone asking a question and you're he and all of a sudden, you're hearing the question that was behind that question. Do you know what I mean? Not the words that came out of their mouth, but you're hearing what, was, what inspired them to ask that question. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes it's like an intuition. And that's, I think, similar to what we're speaking about. The idea that whenever we're listening attentively, we have the possibility not only of being nourished by this swirling, microcosmic galaxy of sounds and vibrations, but also what lies behind them. So the thought I'd like to leave you with is that by becoming quiet enough inside, perhaps it's in that realm that we can become, we can rediscover the magic of listening. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, I'm so glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, two ways. One, uh, it's a podcast, so if you have uh, I iTunes or Stitcher, you can listen to that. Uh, you can go to my web. There's a jimmetzlerproductions.com. It has a lot of sounds on it. And these two CDs have, uh, they're not programs, but they have a lot of great sounds, some of which we've heard tonight. So, and you, that's another way you can hear not so much the stories, but the sounds themselves. And they're also on, online. Yeah, hi. That is online. Uh, go to uh, jimmetzlerproductions.com and you'll hear it. It's there. Uh, it's free. <laughs> uh, or just search, um, search me and Fez and you'll hear it. That's how the uh, Third Coast Festival, if people know about the Third Coast. It's on now uh, in, in Chicago. Uh, they play that, uh, they often play, or they have played uh, Fez a lot there at the Third Coast Festival. Questions? Yeah. Okay. Thank you.